Dhammaling Institute was established in 1991 to meet the needs of the many nuns who have fled Tibet in search of the freedom to study and practice their religion. It is now home to over 200 nuns from Tibet, the Himalayan regions of Kinar, Spiti and Ladakh, and even some from Western countries. A few lay women who want to study the Dharma also live here. Dhammaling is set in a serene and clean area, surrounded by wheat and rice fields, with wonderful views up towards the mountains. We have beautiful landscaped gardens in which so many flowers grow, it seems they are competing among themselves. Birds love this place because it is a green oasis of trees and plants. The burbling of a small stream running through the grounds mingles with the sound of the nuns memorizing the scriptures. Such an environment freshens and inspires us. Construction began in 1993 and was completed in 2005. The nuns themselves helped in whatever way they could in the building of Damalay. The buildings are beautifully designed with a central courtyard, which is the main hub of the nunnery. The focal building is our temple, which contains our prayer hall, a lecture hall, and the library. The classrooms adjoin the main courtyard, and the dining hall and kitchen are the lower end. The library is a very special part of Domaling. You won't find many nunneries or monasteries that provide such a wealth of information right at your fingertips. We are blessed to have such easy access to so many books. There are many languages represented here, including English, German, Hindi, Chinese, Spanish and of course Tibetan. The library shelves are stacked with the Tibetan texts, stored in the traditional way and available to anyone who needs to extend their knowledge. It is an inspiring atmosphere for the nuns to study in. We have several income-generating enterprises that raise funds for our nuns and provide them with experience of basic organizational skills. They operate a small shop for their basic needs. There is a tailoring section in which nuns' robes, wall hangings, bags, prayer flags are made. Those items are on sale in our small handicraft store. There is also a guest house for visitors who want to stay in this peaceful environment. A phone booth and internet cafe provide the nuns with access to the world. An important responsibility at Domali is taking care of our 13 happy, healthy cows so they produce the wholesome milk that is used in the kitchen. They efficiently keep the grass at bay while producing the manure required to make the gardens flourish. We have a well-appointed medical clinic with trained health worker nuns taking care of anyone who is sick or injured. The health workers hold a clinic every evening, treating the straightforward cases and referring the complicated ones to the Tibetan Delic Hospital doctors. Nuns who wish can consult the Tibetan medical doctors. In this way, a comprehensive system of health care is provided for the nuns. Until recently in the history of the world, women have not been given the same opportunities to study as men. By the grace of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and the efforts of the Tibetan Nuns Project, among others, it is now possible for Tibetan nuns to engage in a complete traditional Buddhist study program. Efforts are also being made for the nuns to obtain the highest ordination. In Domaling, they are provided with full study facilities and the best possible qualified teachers. Where?
the traditional Tibetan curriculum has been carefully worked out to be non-sectarian and with the help of the Sakya College near Dehradun and the Nyingma Institute in Balukbi, we now have philosophy teachers from three of the four schools of Tibetan Buddhism. These beautiful hand-painted tankas depict the scholars of ancient India who provided the path to higher learning that is studied in Tibetan monastic institutions. They hang in the Domaling prayer hall as a source of inspiration for the nuns as their studies are rooted in their profound works. It is said that the rooster crow heralds the coming of the dawn, but here the nuns wake up well before the dawn to memorize the religious texts they are studying. Some nuns perform early morning prostrations inside the temple as an offering and purification. As the great scholars say, the beginning and ending of a task are the most essential. So in the first light of dawn, they are called to morning prayers. They file into the hall in order of seniority during the three prostrations that are traditional when first entering a Tibetan temple. His Holiness the Dalai Lama's throne dominates the central position. A large applique tanka behind depicts Sakya Muni Buddha with the Bodhisattva of Compassion Avalokiteshvara on the right and the female Bodhisattva Tara on the left. The nuns pray for His Holiness long life and for a good and peaceful day for all sentient beings. In the adjacent small chapel, Nuns perform a daily ritual to Paldan Hamu. Tea and bread are served as breakfast during the prayers. Sunrise sees the nuns again memorizing texts in preparation for the classes ahead, this time taking advantage of the fresh clear air in the gardens and fields. Morning assembly is held at 6.45 in summer and at 7.45 in winter. The nuns gather in the courtyard, lining up by classes, along with the teachers and recite the morning prayers. Selected nun reads her thoughts for the day, either in English or in Tibetan. Permission to hold marathon in New Delhi. The Tibetan exile includes the Indian government of The principal addresses the nuns, making announcements and encouraging them to study hard today. The assembly ends with the Tibetan national anthem. Classes go on all morning. The philosophy classes are seated in the traditional style 
with the teachers and students sitting cross-legged on mattresses with low tables for their books. Traditional subjects include grammar, religious philosophy, poetry, history, composition, and handwriting. At Domaling, the nuns pay great attention to perfecting and preserving Tibetan calligraphy. The nuns also study Tibetan and English language. In these classrooms, they have tables and chairs and make full use of the blackboard. The teachers are all very dedicated and the nuns study very hard and sincerely throughout the year. They gain great satisfaction from doing well in their exams. When the lunchtime bell rings, everyone goes to the dining hall where the main meal of the day is served. Food is prepared in the kitchen by the nuns themselves. They make their own bread, tofu, curd, and all the milk that is needed in the nunnery is produced by the domaling cows. They also take care of the garbage, segregating the waste that can be fed to the cows from that which must go on to the compost and the dry recyclable waste for that which must be burnt. A carefully worked out system is in operation and everybody is involved in making sure it works. In the afternoon, while some are in the classrooms, other classes work in the fields and do gardening. Great effort is put into growing vegetables as well as developing and maintaining the borders and pot gardens along the verandas. During study sessions, the nuns can go to the library where books can be borrowed and are checked out by our librarian nuns. The nuns also learn the religious arts such as constructing, sand mandalas and butter sculpture. This is a nearly complete sand mandala. Such an achievement represents hours of dedicated training. Butter sculptures are made for particular rituals as well as for the Tibetan New Year. In the computer room, the nuns study how to use computers. Many are now proficient in word processing and Photoshop and they produce their own magazine annually. Traditional Tibetan Buddhist education relies heavily on debate, a method used to gain a thorough understanding of the Buddhist teachings. It is one of the most important and interesting sessions of the nuns day. Gathering in the courtyard after tea, the nuns recite the preparatory prayers together. They then each choose a partner and find a place to sit. In each of the pairs of nuns, one is standing and the other is sitting. The standing nun initiates the topic to be debated from the philosophical text studied earlier that day. Gestures are a crucial part of the debate process. The sitting nun is responsible for a quick and sharp response. If the sitter's answer is satisfactory, the stander moves on to the next question. If not, the stander will make a gesture similar to a hungry crocodile slapping its jaws, loudly smacking her hands together. Each nun has her own style of clapping as she seeks an analytical and in-depth explanation from the sitter. Some standers lunge at the sitter as she claps her hands together while another may stand back and impatiently clap lightly. Some standers anxiously pace while waiting for a response and others stare intensely using eye contact as a weapon. Some allow a few moments for methodical thoughts, while others demand an immediate response. If the sitter speaks softly, then the standard has to crouch in to listen. As the intensity heightens, the enthusiasm grows louder. If the sitter's answer is absolutely off target, a stander will use the same clapping gesture but with the palm facing up. The two will dwell a while longer 
and if there is still no resolution, the teacher is called over to give a final verdict. The air is thick with intensity, but smiles and even some laughter ripples through the courtyard. Sometimes the nuns debate in groups rather than pairs. There is confidence in numbers, and in this way the weak learn from the strong. Debate pushes everyone to study and try to really understand the meaning of the text. Tibetan debate is a healthy competition that creates thoughtful and articulate scholars. Debate is followed by a light supper and then the nuns file back into the hall for the evening prayers. When the evening prayers are finished, they go back to their books and complete the day's homework. The majority of the time is spent studying and memorizing. The life of a nun is many things, including a strict schedule and routine that requires diligence and a sense of inner guidance. They are committed to being good students and good nuns. So when the time comes, they will be able to help those in need by teaching, debating, learning, reciting and sharing the words of Buddha for the good of all sentient beings.